my stand? I don't have one, do I? Oh, is it coming? What happened to it? Our text is found on Luke 17, verse 26 this morning. It's okay. Our title is Misplaced Affections. Thank you so much. Misplaced Music Stands. Misplaced Music Stands. <laughs> I believe this year God's going to set us in. We're going to break the mold of what we thank God for bringing us this far. Is it 17 years? How old are we? 17 years in Merrill Trail? Capital Church? And I believe God's going to... God's working things right now. Amen. God's working things right now for Narrow Trail Cowboy Church. And I don't want to move away so far. We don't want to go too far where we lose people. We, we, we want to maintain what we have because you guys have been faithful. So everyone's important. Am I right? Amen. Let's read in our text this morning. Luke 17, verse 26. Our title is Misplaced Affections. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man, speaking of Jesus. They ate, they drank. Oh, isn't this horrible? They ate and they drank. No, these are good things. They married wives. How many know marrying a good wife is a good thing? Uh, all you men really should have spoke up and said amen on that because to me, seriously, you're going to get in trouble. If you marry a good wife, it's a good thing the Bible says. Come on. Uh -huh. Come on, guys. Oh. Mm. Lord have mercy. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Let me tell you something. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, the Bible says. And you know what? He preached for 120 years. No converts. I don't know about you, but if I preach for 120 years, no converts, I'm probably going to find something else to do. Amen? <laughs> this, you know, this ain't good. But I'll tell you what he did. God pointed this out to me. He got every one of his family into the ark. At least he took his family. Come on. And in verse, uh, I keep losing this, 28, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. God's trying to get the idea across that, 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 he, that he's going to punish unrighteousness. That the day of reckoning is coming. That we're going to give an account for our lives before God before our, for our Savior. And in verse 30, even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, that's not just when He came. When it says revealed, because I was wondering, what does this mean? Was this when Jesus came as a baby? Or is this when He comes back again? When He is revealed to all men, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that He is Lord, that's going to be the day of, of, re, of that He's revealed. Come on. And every man will know this is the Son of God. He was the Son of God, and we missed it yeah. when He came. And we missed it. So, so many missing it now. Amen. 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 Papa lay dying. Daughters were gathered around his bed. Oldest son asked respectfully, Papa, is there anything you want? Papa whispered, I, Yes, I have one last wish. Is there anything? He says, I smell something familiar, so delicious, coming from the kitchen. <laughs> Smells like your mother's apple strudel. Bring me a piece of it, will you? Your mother's strudel is the best. I would so love some. So when he returned empty-handed, the dying father asked, well, where's my apple strudel? And the son with a sad, long face said, Papa, you know how Mama is. She's always so practical and strict. She says the strudel is for after the funeral. <laughs> Sometimes good things are wrong because our priorities are wrong. Now, we are first Sunday of the new year. What could be the best 
resolution you would have. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Most of us, I gotta lose some weight. I'm gonna have to stop eating the apple strudels, you know. <laughs> I gotta stop eating this, I gotta stop eating that. This is my, you know, if I can do this, praise God. But what's the best resolution you can have? I want to challenge you this year to put God first. Amen. Amen. To put God first. Oh, Pastor Victor, you know I put God first. Really? Let's see. If your priorities are off, your lives are going to be off. Consider what Jesus said about the days of Noah. We just read in Lot. He includes Noah, he includes Lot. Jesus didn't just talk about terrible violence. He didn't talk about crime rates, abortion, or drugs, or gross immorality. He didn't include any of that. Which, by the way, Revelations does. But note what people are doing before judgment fell. Eating, drinking. Doesn't mention drunkenness. It just means drinking. Drinking your Coke, your Coke Zero. Amen. Marrying, getting engaged, these are good things. Buying, selling, planting, building. This, this is all before the judgment. These are not sins. They're all good, legitimate things. In fact, all of these are recommended in Scripture. Remember Paul said, if you find a good wife, you find a good thing. And, you have, and notice this part, we all leave this out. And you find favor with God. So, you ladies, if we found you... We got favor with God because we're with you. Come on now, somebody. Amen. It also says in Proverbs, that, or Hebrews, marriage is honorable. Proverbs, a virtuous woman considers a field and buys it. So it's, in, in the Old Testament, women were buying and selling property. You women ought to get excited. <laughs> and with fruit of her hand, she planted the vineyard. She was planting. They were planting and growing stuff. Amen. Come on now. Yes. So Jesus is warning us of total inatten inattention to his word, to his presence, while we have become completely absorbed in our own interests. People in Noah's time were so engrossed in doing good, legitimate things, they had no time to reflect on what Noah was preaching or his warnings, you know. And it just, after a while, you know, you just kind of tune somebody, something out. And so everyone was busy. Say busy. Man, I'm going to tell you, busy is an enemy to relationship, isn't it? Marrying, going out to eat, mixing with their friends, having pleasure, entertainment. They had no time to listen. And in verse 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. When Jesus comes back, this is what's going to be going on. Last generation will be the same. Jesus is saying they'll be so wrapped up in their own interests, they'll put all of my interests aside. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of God is put aside. The gospel is put aside. The presence of God is put aside, you know. Your religion is more important. You know, your, your, you know, your family is more important. A lot of people are not used to hearing people preach about that. We're, we're going to look at some scripture right now talking about if you put your family first, you will damn them to hell. Say, Brother Victor, that's strong words. Look at what it says. It says if you don't discipline them, you, you, you condemn them to hell. And con discipline also means their, their, their interest, their priorities, dealing with your children's priorities, that they are not first, God is. This is something we teach our children. If you wrap your whole world around your children, you pretty much are damning them to hell. We're going to look at that. Jeremiah, verse 2, verse 31. Yet, God says, they do not see their behavior as sinful. They think they're innocent, God says. Jeremiah 2, 31. Wherefore, say, my people, we will come no more to thee. Don't have time for you, Lord. My people have forgotten me days without number, yet they, thou sayest, I am innocent. But they may be doing good, legitimate things. You may be doing good things. But the Lord, if the Lord is not first, you're not innocent. If the Lord is not first, you're not innocent. 
If he was, if he were, they would find time for God, right? Because you know what? We do what we want to. Remember, remember having two jobs, but you found a little girl you're in love with? You had no time during the day, but you found time because you do. Love finds a way. You do what you want. You know, you may have two jobs, eight hours long, 16 hours a day, but you still going to have to find time for that little girl because we do what we want to do, right? So, If he was first in their life, they would find time for him. Now, look at Luke 14, and we'll, 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 uh, finish, we'll finish here with a parable. If you didn't think cowboys were in the Bible, you're wrong. Here's going to be one right here. Cowboys in the Bible. In Luke 14, starting with verse 16 through 24, we have the parable of excuses. <laughs> Jesus uh, now, in this, let me just set this up for you. We're having a feast. I know it's referring to the the marriage uh, feast of the the the, the uh, uh, feast of the Lamb. Uh, in this, that we're all going to be a part of those that that are bought by the blood of the Lamb. Come on, uh, he may be fixing lamb. I don't know. If some of you want turkey, you may better start telling them right now because. It's the marriage feast of the Lamb, and the, and the Lord is preparing it for us, it says. I prepared a table before you, you know. And uh, I don't really like lamb, but I started getting used to it after I keep looking and seeing the lamb, you know. I, I'm, trying to get, I'm trying to like lamb. Anybody like lamb? Like, oh, you do? Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you, I was in Oslo, and all of a sudden I got hit with this smell that smelled like somebody died <laughs> in this Chinese restaurant, and I'm like, what is that? They informed me it was mutton. Somebody had ordered mutton. I had to leave, amen? Left the whole, <laughs> left my dinner and everything. It was so bad, amen? amen? I must have some of that leftover, you know, we fought. We, we ran them guys out of Texas, didn't we? Those, those sheep herders, didn't we now? <laughs> yeah. Is there not a cowboy among us? <laughs> I think I'm going to have to get used to lamb because I think we may have some in heaven, yes. Yeah, but here we see Jesus is the man who is given the feast. And the feast is the gospel. And the table being spread is the cross. And Jesus, the invitation is, for, is from Jesus to everyone. Every man is invited to be a part of this. Come on, somebody. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto me, all of you who will come. Come to my table. So our Lord is inviting us to intimacy, to sup with him and he with us. He's saying, come unto me, and I spread my table before you. Come and sup with me, and I will sup with you. That word sup, deep knee o. To feast, to have supper with, to dine, to dine, to have intimacy with, partake of me. Everything, he's saying, partake of my godliness and my holiness. Come partake of me, he says. And 2 Peter 1 verse 3, his devour, divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Notice life and godliness, all things that pertain to it. And through the knowledge of him that hath called us to the glory and to virtue. The table spread. Dinner is ready. Will you come? There's nothing that gets you more angry, ladies, than you, than you prepare a table for somebody and they don't show up. I said angry. Notice the Lord who is God, who is perfect. When you don't show up to his invitation, he's angry. Did you know God gets angry? I don't know, Pastor Big. God's a God of love all the time. Love, love, love. Let me tell you something. Sometimes mercy and justice have to kiss one another. And God's not. Uh, when He invites you, He expects you to come. Amen. 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 
It's not the first time God's going to prepare a meal for us. Remember he prepared it up on the mountain for the 70 elders and Moses and Aaron, excuse me. Remember that? <laughs> so the master had hope that his invitations would, they would drop everything and come, but nobody came. And it says he became angry. He says, well, then let's just go and buy strangers. And let's go out to the byways and highways and compel them to come in. Come on. Here's the argument and the declaration for bringing people in right here. He says, go to the highways and byways and compel them to come in for that my house may be filled. That my house may be filled. You expect me to do it? That's your job. Amen. <laughs> Brother Victor, you are too straight. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can only do so much, but I'm going to tell you, when you compel them in, that means you put the weak on your back, you carry them in. You try, you go get them. You put them in your cars. It says that you, 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 you carry them in. You put them on your back. They need to be in the house of God. It's that important. Oh, our church ain't that important. Can't you have a relationship with God alone? You know, we've talked about that. That there's a corporate side. There's an there's a intimate side, you and God. But you also have to be a part of what God, the whole, you have to be a part of the body also. It's very important that we are in the house of God. It really is. Do you feel rejected when somebody doesn't come to your invitation? God does. The master sent out a servant to remind his guests that all was ready. This was the Holy Spirit. And nobody came. And so it was the last call. Supper is ready. Why haven't you come? Verse 18. Then they all, with one consent, accordingly began to make excuses. So here we go. Number one, verse 18. Here's the first excuse. See if you've heard this one before. The first invited guest is a, in the real estate. He excused himself because he was busy with a real estate deal. I have, he says, I have bought a piece of ground and I need to go see it. I pray that he have me excused. I won't be there. Now, normally when you buy a piece of land, you go see it first. But now he's got to go see if what his deal was any good. And so it is, it is no sin to buy land, right? It is no sin to buy, to build a house. Am I right? Amen. So just before judgment fell on Judah, if you remember, Elijah bought a piece of land because of a revelation he received through a dream. Buying land is not the point here, right? How many think buying land is bad? Nope. I hope not because I... I would like to see the church do that. Buying land is not the point. This man had the wrong focus. He focused on his own interests rather than the kingdom of God. And his business and his family interests were first. And he put aside the invitation to intimacy with his master because he was busy. So maybe later he says, but I have to take care of business now. So here, here it is. My interests come first. The fact is that that land wasn't going nowhere. It'd be there after, the, after he finished with his master. And he could have gone the next day. It's, this is what I call misplaced affections. Are you struggling with that today? Here's the second one. Here's the cowboy. The second guest invited was a cowboy. Look, look he speculated in cattle, roll them, roll them, keep them doggies moving, raw hide, amen? Everybody know that song? Roll them, roll them, roll them, keep them doggies moving, raw hide. Don't try to understand them, just roping them on them random. Soon we'll be way high and wide. This is going on national television right here, yeah? I have bought five yoke of oxen. That's ten cows. And I go to prove to test them. He done bought them. Now he got to test them. He got to do that when God has invited him to do something else. 
And I pray thee have me excused. I'm busy. So he buys 10 cows and they had looked good when he bought them, but now he got to go see if they're good. Now he had to test them to see if they got, he gotten a good deal. Are these guys going to pull my wagon? And so this is a picture of those who put jobs and occupa occupation, business ahead of God. It was a legitimate responsibility he had to care for. You know, how many know you got to take care of your animals? If you don't take care of your animals, you don't need animals. I have a neighbor. I, I said I have a neighbor. Y'all trying to get me started? I got a neighbor. Are you watching, neighbor? He got lots of. I, I allowed him to he, to put his to put four horses on my pasture. Next time I look, look there's ten. And, and he don't give them hay. And they're starving to death. People driving by, coming knocking on my door. Your horses are starving. You need to feed them. <laughs> they look like bags of bones. <laughs> oh, they're fine, he says. And then the fact, you know, that don't. And then he buys pigs and he buys chickens. He buys, and they all come into my yard. Amen. And they don't. They can't poop in their own yard. They got to poop in mine. Amen. Don't get me started. <laughs> so I. We led these people to the Lord. They were in, anyway, so I can't just let them have it. we got to work with these people and love them anyway. But my goodness, it's so hard to get the truth over to some people. Amen. And so here, these animals are starving. And my wife is like, you need to get some hay. At one point, I, I fed them, you know. And uh, it's amazing how... We put everything before God, and then we don't even take care of that, you know. We just let everything kind of, because our lives are not in order, things just get out of order, you know. And we don't take care of even the things that God gives us. So he, he, here he was being a diligent provider for his family, but this is not the point. His sin was that he acted as if going to the barn was more important than coming to fellowship with the master. And so those cows could have been tested the next day, don't you think? Yes. And he couldn't make the cows wait, so he's going to make the master wait. And don't we do that to God sometimes? Misplaced affections. Here's the last one. The last guess, verse 20. This one's the biggest of all, I might add. So, oh boy. Now this one says, well, my goodness, this is the day I'm getting married. I mean, no, that's a good excuse. I'm getting married. I have married a wife. <laughs> and therefore, I cannot come. Well, I mean, how many of you know we got to consummate that marriage and get it on down the road? Amen? Amen. Yeah. Are y'all dead or something? Uh, Hello? Dead. Aren't you excited about this? <laughs> Nothing could be more legitimate than getting married. Amen. Amen. Proverbs. A man who finds a good wife, but look over at your wife and smile because this is a good time for you to come in with Brother Victor. Amen. A man who finds a good wife finds a good thing and obtains favor with God. Amen. Hi, honey. <laughs> now, isn't it curious that the master evidently has not invited her because he don't know her. She's, she should have been at that feast with him. But the master don't know her. So the marriage is not the issue here. This man sinned in that he put his family first. Jesus is saying devotion to family is a must and it, had, it has its place, but not when it takes... Listen to this. It has its, every, all these things have its place, but not when it takes my place, God says. Not when it takes my place. This man could have brought his wife to the feast. He could have said to her, Honey, let's just establish this right now. God is first in our life. Honey, as for me and my house, and you're part of my house now, we're going to serve the Lord. Let's make the Lord's interest our interest. Let's put God first. He could have done that, but he did not. The sin of putting family before the Lord is very prevalent today. I'm going to tell you, it is very prevalent. I know uh, housewives who find it hard to come to church on Sundays because they're taking their kids. They have practice. 
soccer practice. They plenty of time all to run all week long, but they can't find time to be with the Lord. They're on the run constantly doing special things for the children. They're making time for soccer, music lessons, dance classes, school functions. This is, I have two, I have daughters. I mean, their lives are full, but they, they've got their kids in church on Sunday, praise God. But uh, this is not just about attending church. This is about putting God first, amen. Shopping, entertainment, all these things, making time for their children, but not for God. Now, this sends a message. This creates narcissism. You first. These kids are not seeing mom and dad put God first. These kids are seeing that they are put first. And what this creates in our generation now is a generation of narcissism where they cannot even, they cannot even receive the gospel. Because the gospel that has sacrifice in it, they can't receive it. Let me tell you, if your gospel and your Christianity doesn't have sacrifice in it, you don't have Christianity. And so what we got prevalent in the church today, and I know I travel all over the world, America, in the churches, is a gospel that is man-centered and not God-centered. Because they cannot handle a gospel that would require that they lay their lives down. They cannot handle a gospel that talks about the blood Come on. Or any kind of sacrifice. And my Bible tells me if you want true worship, then you're, you know, he, what, did, what does he say there in Romans, you know? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. That means we're not subjecting our bodies to all this stuff out here in this world. All this unholiness and all this, this, uh, this, uh, set, you know, this uh, fornication. The word is portier which means fornication or immorality. He says, subject, you know, to, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. Right, amen? And this is your reasonable service. In other words, God's saying, because I've redeemed you to you to present your bodies to me, holy. Come on. With sacrifice. So the message coming through is very clear, very clear today. My kids are first. I didn't grow up in a house where I was the most important thing. I was expected to be quiet and listen to what the adults had to say. They liked my little stories. I used to entertain the guests, you know, with my exaggeration stories. I know you can't believe it, but uh, I could come up with some whoppers, amen? I just told these stories. In fact, I, I talked to some people from, from Brazil, you know, I grew up fishing for the piranha and eat having monkeys and I had I had parrots and I, I didn't grow up like y'all did, you know? And by the way, before you think I wasn't a cowboy, I had my first horse when I was probably four or five years old. And we had I even had a, a doe, a baby doe that we found and we had a wolf dog that was a wolf. And then he almost killed the neighbor kid so we had to get rid of him. And uh, of course that boy was throwing rocks at him and one day somebody left the gate open. So when that boy came by to throw rocks, that, that wolf proceeded to take a little vengeance out on that little poor boy. Amen. So anyway, I grew up kind of kind of jungly. Jungle, if you ever seen the jungle book, I relate to that story very well. Amen. <laughs> Amazon. Amazon, yeah. Now down there, we don't call them cowboys, we call them vacaros. And my first word that I spoke was not mommy and daddy. I would ride up on the Jeep, point things out to mom and daddy, and my first word was cavalo, which is Portuguese for a horse. So I'd point out all the cavalos, you know, and that's what I did, all right. Well, if you neglect God's interests and put your children first, you will damn them to hell. Now, Pastor Victor, that is just two stronger words. No, it's not. If you don't discipline your children, the scripture says, you, he says that you, you'll damn them to hell. They won't, they will, they, if they think they're first, they'll never be able to put God first. Uh, Come on. That's right. uh, uh, uh. They'll never put God first, ever. We got a generation now, if it's not about them, they're not interested. They're going to stay home. If they're, not doing the, if they're not doing something special in the church, they're staying home. 
And I get this all the time from this generation. We'll watch you from home, from the house, Pastor. I'm with you. Amen. I had a whole generation like that. It's like I got this church that's out there somewhere that I can't connect with that are telling me they're connected, but I don't have any connection with them. They're, they're hiding behind their computers. So we're not against this generation. We want to compel them to come in, but they've got to come in. They've got to come in. But you know what? There's a problem. They're first. What are we going to do with that? So what most pastors do is let's make it about them. You can't do that. They have got to get past themselves to the cross. They have got to put themselves dead to Christ, but alive through Jesus Christ. Come on. And they've got to do that, and we've got to preach the truth to them. We can't go around their little feelings. We can't pat them on the back and tell them it's going to be all right. It's not going to be all right. We have got to compel them to Christ, not to us, to Christ. Let me give you an example of the scriptures. That's what happened to Hezekiah and his son Manasseh. Hezekiah had been a good king. And Elijah came to him and says, get your house ready, you're going to die. Well, Hezekiah wept. He didn't want to die. So he turned his face to the wall on his bed and cried. And before Elijah got out of the corridor, God said to him, go back and tell him he can live 15 more years. Oh. Ain't God good? Well, guess what he does with those 15 years that God gives him? It would have been better if he had died. Because with those 15 years, he built buildings and monuments to himself. He, got, he bought himself toys to play with. And he married a little girl that should have been is like his granddaughter. And had a baby with her and they called him Manasseh. Who became the next king of, of Israel. The most wicked king Israel has ever known. This man was so evil, so narcissistic about himself, because Hezekiah had doted upon him, you know, doted upon him, heaped him with gifts, heaped him with favor. And this boy grew up to be the most wicked, evil king against righteousness, brought Israel to worship Baal and Ashtoreth and all the gods. And guess what? You, remember, you know Isaiah, the prophet? He chased Isaiah till he caught him in a tree. Isaiah was hiding in a hollow tree. And rather than just pull him out, they saw the tree in half with Isaiah in it. Manasseh, the worst king Israel ever had. What a narcissistic, evil little boy that grew up to be in charge of Israel. Let me tell you. It's important that God is first. It's important we put God first. It's important those kids know God's first. It's important that they see that we are going to put God first. Not them. It's important that we're in the house of God. It's important that we're leading in holiness and righteousness in our homes. And that we have the guts to turn off a television program with our kids watching it. That's showing body parts or saying words that we don't want them to, to continue. to. And you expect them and you're going to spank them for saying it when you're sitting there watching it on television. I, I don't know what's got into me right now, you know. But I know how I know us. I know how we are. I know what I did, you know. With some of my kids. I should I look back now, I was like, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done this. If somebody somebody needs to say something. Amen. We're living in the evil times. And not everything we're doing is evil. But if we're too busy to, to make God first, then and then we're wondering why our society is going. I want to challenge you. I don't know what the rest of my sermon is. Just let it go. I want to challenge you right now. Let my wife come on up here with me. Let's all stand right now. We're going to put God first. How many want to do this? I want to, I want to end with this. 
What did God say? He got angry because they wouldn't do it. And he said, I say unto thee, more than these men which we were divided shall taste. They shall not taste of my supper. They shall not taste the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are people that were invited by God himself. These are Christians. They shall not taste my supper, God says. He was angry. I don't want God angry at me, do you? Do you want God angry at you? Let's right now take the hand of your neighbor. <laughs> Some of them, I want to say one more thing before we, before we make God. We're going, to, we're going to take a resolution before God to make him first this year. Is that some of them came and said, Lord, he says, we did works in your name. We cast out devils in your name, healed the sick, and spoke, tongue, spoke in tongues all for your glory. And his answer was very clear. I never knew you. Depart from me. You're not invited to this meal anymore. That's harsh, isn't it? But you know what? It comes right down to mercy and justice. And God's been merciful and extended his son to us. We need to respond before it's too late. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior right now, you need to raise your hand and say, I want to receive this, 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 this Savior into my heart right now. Anybody like that? Come on. Anybody? Well, then right now as a body, let's all do this together. Father, wash us and cleanse us of our sins and of our, our uh, the priorities that we have, Lord, that are not your priorities. We want your, this year, your priorities to be our priorities. So right now, we're going to pay attention to this thing. Father, we put you first. Amen. In our businesses, we put you first. In our marriage, we put you first. I want my wife to love God more than me. Did you know that? Because that's the order. My, marriage, my kids are not more important than God. God is more important. So he's first. Family second. Ministry, whatever it is. Your business comes after that. But we put God first where he belongs. Father, in everything we do, our business, our pleasures, we put God first. We say, Lord, you're going to be first this year. And Lord, we want you to be, to be supreme in everything we do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so right now, as we hold hands together, we agree that no one here, and those that are, that are not with us today, that are sick, they're, them, that they as well, who fellowship with us, and... and we're just saying they shall not be touched by this devil. This, this man-made infection to kill people. This COVID shall not touch one hair of us here in the Old Trail Cowboy Church. Shall not touch our children, our wives, our husbands in Jesus' name. We as a body apply the blood just like they did to the doorpost there in Israel. And all the plagues came. It didn't touch one Israelite. It didn't touch one Israelite. We apply the blood of Christ right now by faith. Right now by faith. Not one. You better, you better agree with me in this. Come on now. Don't stand outside of this thing. Come on. We agree together that your protection, the blood protects. The blood covers. The blood. The blood of Christ. Right now to prevail over plagues and infections. Even, even snakes that bite. In Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. All right.